in general, what I was saying was I, I have been thinking a lot about the, uh, the notion of forgiveness and, and what that means. I, I think about it a lot. You know, you know that for a couple of weeks I was angry. So now I'm in a different mode of thinking about how do you repair? How do you, uh, you know, how do you, how do you forgive? How do you move past things? In the Torah, it's not, it's definitely, it's something that human beings have to think a lot about, about but it's also a question that, uh, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu asks about himself and his relationship with uh, the nation, which is when we break our relationship with God, how, how could that relationship be repaired? One of the premises of the entire Torah, one of the basic premise is that, that everything can be repaired. I think in, in human relationships that feels a lot more complex. There are certain things that feel unforgivable or irreparable for us. Um, I, even on a personal level, if you think about it around yourself, to what degree are you as a human being, and I, I would really ask you to wonder about this, to what degree are, as a human being, are you able to move past certain aspects of yourself or certain moments of your life? Uh, to what degree are we trapped maybe in something that's happened already and not necessarily able to, to move into the present. I ask all these questions because of this past week's parasha and going forward into Seva Bimidbad. This last week, we finished uh, Seva Vayikra. We read Behar and Bechul Kotai. In those parashiot, there's a lot of discussion of the concepts of Shemitah and Yovel. These are not uh, new concepts. Anybody, everybody's learned about them at some point. They, but they're not applicable concepts, especially if you don't live in Israel at all. The concept of Shemitah in, in living in New York City and in America is just absurd. I mean, we don't have Shemitah. There's no such thing. We, we know that we read about it in the Torah, but we don't actually apply that to our lives, right? We don't have a year where everybody takes off of work. I'm saying that ironically, right? Thank you, Sharon. Yes, the few people who leave their camera on, I feel like I could, <laughs> I could see. Um, but we don't take a year off of uh, tilling the fields um, that dramatically, correct? And we know that we're going to go into to a coronavirus conversation, which we have to because it's our lives right now. Um, although, although your husband, uh, Rabbi Ricky, does get off. Radical. A sabbatical. So. Right. There's, there is the concept, and, it, and that's what it's called. It's called a sabbatical, you know, a sabbatical year. Yeah. The premise of it being that you're taking a Sabbath. You're taking, and, you know, those sabbatical years, they are, they occur once every seven years, um, which is very interesting. Um, so we do have the concept. It's there somewhere. We don't live that way. We don't, we don't, most human beings do not live. We, uh, you know, observant Jews, and, and even in our community, we're still working on reaching the point where we have a weekly Sabbath, right? We're still <laughs> trying to embrace the concept of you've got to take off one day a week. You've got to separate that day. And the number of conversations we still have to have around that are, you know, are still very large. I, you know, a lot of people always assume that they, that everybody's keeping Shabbat and that everybody, I mean, maybe if you, I, I think in my naivete, I assume that, in fact, I know that most people have difficulty keeping Shabbat and, and maybe they think, you know, they keep their version of Shabbat. Like I played with the kids on Saturday, but it's not necessarily uh, the biblically mandated Sabbath. On top of that, to imagine uh, instead of a one day Sabbath, a full year Sabbath at the end of seven, seven you know, the, the seventh year, is very, very difficult, I think, for, for the modern mind to conceive of. The most difficult thing to conceive of, I believe, is the concept of Yovel. The concept of Yovel is, is, the, is where we're at, and you, you see the layering in Judaism, right? Because we're in Shavuot, that's why we're talking about this, this is like pre-Shavuot class. Next, year we'll, next week we'll conclude, we'll do a second Shavuot class. In Shavuot, we get, we're counting seven times seven. We count 49 days. The 50th day is Shavuot. It's, and you have to, there's this emphasis over and over. Yeah, I got to complete the full seven weeks. You got to count them. You got to, you got to make sure you're doing it the right way. It's only when they're completed that you have that 50th. And that's what we call Shavuot. It becomes a holiday. Yovel is that, you know, is a version of that on a, on a much larger scale. It's the 50th year is the, the Pentecostal year, 
and the Christians actually have a holiday that they call Pentecost, which is uh, 50 days after Easter. You see, guys, you know the Christians are just Jews, but they like gave different names to everything, right? Um, I think they're hysterical, but I don't get the hiding of the eggs. I, like, I'm sure, don't send me articles. I could research it myself. But the idea of like eggs around your yard, it's just, it doesn't sound like a thing to do. But okay, every, to each is up. Um, but either way, so Yovel says, and this was this is what we read in the parasha list on Shabbat, I, at this 50th year, you completely reset society, okay? You take everybody, everybody go, it's almost like everybody starts at one, at zero, you live for 50 years, and then you, you hit a button, and life resets to the zero state again. Everybody, it's, it's, it's literally, I was using this example with my kids, it's like, it's like you're playing a very long game of chess or risk or monopoly, right? And you get really into it and everybody's getting very upset. And, very, and at some point before the game is over, you're just like, no, let's wipe the board clean. We're going to go back to stage one. Why the Torah is so insistent upon this structure of our lives is fascinating, right? The, the idea that it's going to layer it into our lives on a weekly level, right? By day, by year, and then almost by era, like generationally, um, and then even internally inside of the year, you have a seven of a counting of a seven times seven weeks. And then we celebrate at the end of Shavuot is going to be a time that we celebrate the receiving of the Torah. And in some ways, you really have to think about this holiday, and this is the way I conceive of it, as a reset. It's, you know, Pesach is considered the beginning of the Jewish year. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we, we don't really count from Tishrei. And the arrival of, of Shavuot is a time where the nation is reminded and resets and reorients itself towards the Torah, towards the accepting the Torah, the receiving of the Torah. And we use that as a way to then move forward into the rest of the year. So I'm going to open up the chat for a minute because I just want to see what you, for those of you who have access to, to, to typing, I think sometimes it's hard for people to type in a chat. How have you, do you, what do you think of this? Do you have any opinions about the, the mandated reset of the Torah? I'll leave that open. Anybody could type at any point. Um, Victoria, are you unmuted because you want to chat with me or just hit randomly? Because I'll take your, your unmuting, Victoria Shabbat. Are you there? No, I lost her. Okay. So any thoughts? My chat is staying quiet, so I will expand. I'm going to talk about something I, I, you know, I think you've all seen this, that Stephanie Kurtz privately, I'm sorry, I said it out loud, said it's almost like an antidote to capitalism, but I'm going to play around with that. And say, it is, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's an antidote. It's definitely not a, the capitalistic society philosophy, right? Imagine if all of the real estate owners in uh, New York were told like after 50 years, sorry, we're just gonna, we're gonna go back and give it back to everybody who wants I mean, it, it, it would be complete chaos, right? We can't live like that. But think about it this way. I got a video from a friend this week. I'm sure it went around uh, to other people's phones as well. I, actually, maybe not, because I think my family member took it. They were filming the ocean in Deal, okay? They're filming the ocean, and it's, there are whales jumping out of the water, like very near to the, to the coast. And then we were talking about how if you go now and you look into the, into the water at the beaches of, D, of, of New Jersey, which many of us have had opportunity to do in our lives, it's clear. People are saying you could look into the ocean and you could actually see sand and, and the water is clean. And anybody who's grown up in this world for the last whenever knows that I don't, I've never really seen a clean ocean in my, in my lifetime. And we're getting a lot of reports of things like this from all over the world of these places that we thought were permanently environmentally damaged or, you know, or, or the, the, the skies were always unclear. People couldn't breathe uh, the, the, the toxicity of the environment that we're seeing it disappear because of, of the current state of the world of the lockdowns. So I, there's something extremely joyous about the idea that maybe the world physically will have a type of reset because of this. What I find tragic 
and said and that I can't even uh, absorb is that I, I don't think that this is the way that I, you know, it's very upsetting that this is the way a reset has to happen. I don't want anybody to have been suffering or to be ill or for humanity to have to, 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 to be in this state. But I think we all know that while we are suffering through coronavirus, we're also seeing the benefits. And one of the benefits, one of the extraordinary benefits is that humanity is undergoing a reset. And when we see it, oh, somebody, Barbara Chaser just wrote, we now can see across the ocean from New Jersey to New York, right? You see that, that clear vision across the sky, which is, which is shocking. Um, an opportunity to reset is always good. It, it goes along with Judaism, the concept of self-improvement, right? So it does. The issue is the Torah this past week, very sadly, said something that I said a few weeks ago. You know, it speaks about the need for a reset on these, on these moments of seven. You know, you have seven and then you reset. You have seven and then you reset. Um, and Hashem says in, in this last week's parasha, if, if, you do, if you behave, you're going to see a flourishing of your life. You're going to see an increase of, of happiness of your existence. And when things go wrongly, um, I'm going to have to punish you seven times seven. It's, oh, it's always time seven, time seven. Anybody, anybody read the Torah this week? You might have noticed it, okay? Um, he, he, says, he says it repeatedly. Um, the, the, the sadness there is that we never want to hit, hit a moment where Hashem demands this reset of us, but that we offer it um, as, as, as a people. So keeping all of that in mind, I do think one thing that I want us to absorb from the Torah is that the Torah thinks that a reset is necessary at all levels of existence. It doesn't think that this reset is a nice idea. Um, it believes that this reset is mandatory for the persistence of our of a healthy life okay and that if we if we don't take the time to consistently check ourselves and and remove ourselves from these patterns and i do think the monopoly game is the best example right the monopoly game you're playing you're playing by the way do you all know the history of monopoly did you listen to my husband's talk on it once that it was created by a woman who actually wanted to teach people how icky capitalism was, but actually it worked in the reverse and everybody who uses it is like, no, I love this game. Um, and okay, she tried, she wanted people to get sad. But either way, when you play Monopoly and you get that one guy and he has hotels everywhere and, and you just can't get out under the thing and you got the wrong property from the very beginning, you had the purples, you, you wanted the yellows and you can't. And you gotta, you, at some level, you get, you get to a point in your life where you say like, how do I break out of the system? And you hope that somebody will help, help you break out. You know, we, a lot of people talk about this on a global level with, um, with debt forgiveness. Uh, there are certain nations that are so deeply in debt that they, they just can't never get out of, uh, out of that state. Um, so a lot of people think about it. Is it the right thing to do? Is it the wrong thing to do? I'm not, a ca I'm not an economist. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm only here to talk about the Torah and to say that the Torah clearly feels that without an opportunity for people to reorient themselves, uh, that you get trapped in unhealthy cycles as a society. Um, I'm going to take a, a minute. I want to just, I see some things popping up on the chat and then I'll come right back to that, that idea. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda Soror. It's also the world, the natural world does the reset for itself throughout its existence. But the Torah is asking us to make a conscious effort to reset and reflect. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and I agree with A.B. Mala. He wrote it probably. I'm sure no one appreciates a reset at this expense. I know we're all on the same page about that. I have a difficult time associating Shavuot with the Torah and receiving of the Torah. Um, I, you know, to a degree that is, um, that's a, you know, we, we, that was sort of imposed on the holiday afterward. We, I think we all know that the holiday existed. It's also a festival. It's also, it, it, it's a, it's a harvest festival. It's about the bringing of our first fruit. We bring Brikurim then. Um, the way that the rabbis decided the, the meaning of the holiday is interesting though, right? They had this agricultural harvest festival and they layer it with meaning and the meaning that they layer it with is this is a time for renewal we're going to you know this is a time of, of of accounting up towards something that symbolism of the seven times seven and the reaching of the 50 for them is the opportune moment to discuss 
um, the renewal of the Jewish people. And, for, and whenever Jews are talking about their own reset and renewal, they have to talk about it in terms of law and in terms of the Torah and the, and the moral and ethical code of the Torah. Um, I'm going to go to Michelle's comment. She says, since there, there, so since there are resets in places, that imply that it's sort of impossible to mean that, that reset long term. Um, yes, Michelle. Uh, Michelle Shalom, are you there? Can you unmute yourself for a minute? Hello. Hi, Michelle. So I love, the, I love what you wrote. You, are you asking, is, it imp, is the Torah implying that it's impossible for somebody to just be good all the time? Right, yes. Okay. Um, and would you agree that from your own life experience, having met human beings, that the answer is yes? Yes. <laughs> just to see it in print. It's, it's, it's very interesting. It all the time. It's very interesting when the Torah, you know, in its prescient, uh, prophetic narrative, understands how difficult it is for human beings to maintain healthy systems and healthy orders. I, I find that the reason that I, I don't understand how somebody who reads the Torah every week and authentically cannot be inspired by it and say, this is the way I'm going to live my life. 3,000 years ago, to, to understand that human beings will consistently need to understand the, the need for a reset and a refresh, and, and that that's a necessity. I mean, if that's not a prophetic vision of reality, I don't know what it is because I don't think that a, the human mind doesn't understand it. There seems, I'm sorry if I'm getting it overly eloquent, but there's a divinity to the concept of looking at things so globally and from so high above the human experience to say resets will be, will be necessary, right? So, um, I'm going to just go to one more. The Torah never mentions associating the time. It does not. I said uh, the, the rabbis are going to associate Shavuot and the receiving of the Torah. I like the way that the rabbis are speaking uh, through it. Um, I, I, I love how people are private messaging me. You don't have to because it's, they're all interesting. Somebody said, you know, was World War I and the way we responded to, to World War I where people did go into deep depression and debt. And that led to the rise of World War II. We know that that's what happened. It had to do with that we weren't willing to do a reset. After World War II, the entire world did reset um, it, it dramatically. And we are, we are still reaping a lot of the benefits of that reset. I, you know, I was talking, I was watching a show with my kids where there's this alternate universe and Japan is martialized in this world. Um, and they're still, they're still the enemy of so many people. And my kids are like, what are they talking about? Japan is like a nothing country. I'm like, guys, once upon a time, Japan was not a nothing. It was like, was our, they were our arch enemies, right? Um, and the holidays are set up for personal, personal rose. So it's designated time for us. And yes, man in the high castle. Thank you very much. So um, the, the, the issue at hand is there is this need. We, we, whether we understand it or not, whether we demand it of our world or not, the Torah is prophetic and preaching and saying it has to be done. The direction I want to take this in now is this. How this connects to Migilat Rut is very interesting. So on Shavuot, which is a holiday of sevens and the, and the multiplying, the rabbis say this is a good time to read Migilat Rut for a lot of reasons. Migilat Rut is a time where it is a, is a text that talks about First of all, it's, most of it is said in a field, okay? There's a woman, she's, you know, there's a lot of gathering uh, uh, of the produce of the field. It takes place around the same time. It starts, it sounds like in, the, in May, in, in, in like the late spring, and it's going to bleed into the summer. It's going to, the story ends at the end of summer. Um, and uh, aside from that, it's a story about a Moabite, okay? It's a story about Ruth HaMoaviyah. So, if you have to think, and this is where uh, Megillat Root is very controversial, it's about a Moabite woman. Moab is our natural, is in many ways our natural enemy. Um, we are not allowed to marry them. Uh, they have done many horrible things. For those of you who don't remember, I'm going to remind you. Um, the way that Ammon and Moab came to be, the, the sister tribes, I feel like I should pull a map up, but I know not everybody's even looking at their phone, so I'm not going to do it is that these are, the, these are the children of Lot. How did they become the true children of Lot? Abraham and Lot separated. They had a big fight. The way that they had a big fight is that their capital and their money became too large and they couldn't figure out how to coexist. Everybody wanted to be the boss. Everybody wanted to be the thing. Lot goes to live in Sodom. Sodom is destroyed. He escapes with his daughters. 
His daughters think it's the end of the world. They get him drunk. They sleep with him. Um, he has two children from that. The children are called from my father, Moav, the child of my father, Amon, right? The child, both of them are named to, to indicate that, that incestuous relationship. It's, it's a terrible beginning of a nation. Um, but in the Torah, we, the Torah never really wants us to forget that, they, that we're somehow related to them. It doesn't ever erase that relationship that Ammon and Moab are, are our cousins, right? Through Lot and Abraham. It's a distant cousin, but they're cousins. When we're traversing in the desert and we're about to go into Israel and we need food and water, Moab is not, and Ammon, they do not open up their borders to us. In fact, we go to war with them, not with the Moab. I'm not doing all the, all the full details, but they don't feed us. They don't take care of us. And, uh, and we do fight with them uh, a lot back and forth. So now here comes Megillat Ruth setting up uh, an existence where the opening of the Megillah is there's this man and there's a famine in the land of Israel and he goes to Moab because that's a place of, for, you know, that seems more fertile. He takes his family there, but he dies there. His two sons die there and he's, his widowed wife is left with her two daughter-in-laws, Orpa and Rut. Naomi is her name. And she has nowhere to go. She, has, she, she doesn't belong in Moab. She has no life. She has no children. She is reduced to returning to the land of Israel. She returns to Israel. And upon her return, her daughter-in-laws are following her. And we know the story. We should know the story. Um, she keeps insisting that they go back to Moab because there is nothing for them in Israel. She basically says, listen, I'm never having another kid. You're not getting, there's, there's, there's not going to be any, anything for you there. You're going to just be a foreigner there. Go home. Or Pa goes home, but Ruth refuses to leave her mother-in-law's side. She sticks by her. And in words that are parallel to the words that Abraham and Lot use, Abraham says, if you go left, I'll go right. If you go north, I'll go south, right? He says, Wherever you go, I'll go in the opposite direction. Famously, Ruth says to Naomi, wherever you go, I go. Where your home is my home, your God is my God. So she reverses the original story and she sticks by Naomi and they return home. The rabbis feel that this is the right thing to read this time of year because on one level, it's very representative of the agricultural and physical time. But on another level, it's also about the possibility of return on multiple levels. And I want you to see the way the rabbis are layering this. They say in, in many ways, they see Shavuot as emblematic of the Yovel and of Shemitah and of Shabbat in that it is a reset and a return to a previous order that was lost. And who is very representative of that? If not Ruth HaMoaviyah, a Moabite woman who comes to the land of Israel and ends up being the mother of Israel's future king. If that's not the possibility of a reversal of direction and a, and, and a reset of, of what we think is the standard way of being, so if you go to somebody and you say, can a Moabite woman be the, the mother of the queen of Israel? They laugh at you, right? But that's the, the Torah always loves to play with that motif and to say, human beings, you must believe in the possibility of a return and a reset. It is fundamental to your improvement as a, as a, as a, as a species and, and definitely as the, as the nation of Israel. So why do they then layer, the rabbis then say, let's layer this with Matan Torah we spoke about, because they feel that Ruth also took upon herself the burden of the Torah. I'm going to say it again more logically than that. The rabbis say, what does return mean? When we're using these words, they're very empty, a return, a reset. They, it only means one thing, okay? I'm going to read you from this past week's parasha. This is, um, this is, I'm sorry to say, if you, if you read Bechul Kotai, I, I mean, we read it with my kids and I, I actually felt like I had to stop reading it because it was so dark and graphic 
that I needed, I don't, I didn't want to read it in front of the children. So if you did, so me, if you're in a dark mood, don't read it. Um, but it's basically, it lists these horrifying images of destruction um, and about the, the way that the nation is going to be reduced in, the, in, this, in, the, in a time of, of desolation. Um, yeah, as long, I'm going to read you some of this in English. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, because it did not rest in your Sabbaths when you dwelt upon it. And upon those who are left alive of you, I will send a faintness into their hearts, and they will shake like a leaf, and you will perish. Okay, and it goes on that way for a while. But then it stops all of those curses, which is what we call them, and it says, But, um, um, we don't know what that means. Rabbi Shama writes upon it extensively that God says he will walk almost against them, right? Um, but then he says, after this, I am going to remember my covenant with Yaakov. And my covenant with Yitzchak. I want you to hear the Hebrew because I want you to hear how the Torah layers this. I'm going to remember it. I'm going to remember my covenant and I'm going to remember the land. Right? And I will remember the land. The land will also it will forsake them and they, the land will take her Sabbath as she lies desolate and as they make amends. Um, because they abandoned me because I am the God. But he says, but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors. And I'll read that to you in Hebrew. He says, but I am going to recall the covenant. I'm going to recall the covenant. It's very fundamental, this recalling of the covenant. Now God uses it for pro and con here. He says, I'm going to remember the covenant. But when I remember the covenant, it might be used, you know, that leads to punishment because I'm going to hold you accountable for it. But it also ultimately leads to redemption because I'm going to allow you to return to me. So when we as a people are thinking about, well, what is our internal system of return and reset for the Torah? It always has to be framed within the covenant, right? Ruth's ability to return the basis of it is an absorption into the covenant. She says it very clearly. I accept upon myself the covenant of, of Israel. I, I am now part of that nation. And in accepting it, she opens up the possibility for an entirely new world order to begin. Um, I, I was thinking about for myself and about what Michelle is saying, I, I think human beings know the difference between right and wrong and what they should and should not be doing. I don't think human beings are always recalling the covenant, okay? And by that, I mean, how, to what degree are we saying, wait a minute, I am bound by a system that I have let go of. I am bound by a system that I have lost sight of. How do I re-covenant myself to that system in an authentic way, right? Um, and so too for um, those who have, who have trespassed these systems, if we don't open up the space for people to return and to recall the covenant, that doesn't help anyone, right? That just leads to the perpetuation of a, of a cycle of evil, right? The world we have to create has to be one where we can help people return to the covenant, recall the covenant, re remember their moral and ethical responsibilities. If we're going to continue to hold people responsible to an old system, I don't know that we're ever getting anywhere. My father-in-law, who's on this phone call, I don't know if he's still listening, told a story this Shabbat that, I, that he was repeating, that a story that Rabbi Azancourt told, but I'm going to quote it here because it, it moved me also when he told it. He told the story, Rabbi Azancourt told a story about a man and he had to take his son to a bathroom in a restaurant and he goes into the restaurant and they say, no, the bathroom's only for customers. And then they're being tough, but then the waitress says, okay, fine, go, 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 you could go. The man takes his son in, the owner of the restaurant sees him, how could you be here? I didn't let you in. Um, and the man doesn't want to get the waitress in trouble, so he, he says, no, I am a customer. And he sits down and he orders food, so he doesn't get the waitress in trouble, right? Um, and then 
the end of the story is that the, the boss realizes what the customer does and he gives him the meal for free. So in so many stories in life, and then my father-in-law was saying how he then took that story in and there was somebody who did him wrong, but instead of saying, getting this woman in trouble, he let it go and he gave her an opportunity to make amends. So uh, in general, the, the issue that we're confronted with right now from Migilat Rut, from Shavuot, and from the concept of a reset is, to what degree are we allowing the people around us to reset themselves? When I work with high school students, the number of times at the end of the meetings with my high school students that I have to say, okay, let's forget this and start fresh, I, I, I would say every single meeting, because with me, if they're meeting, they're probably in trouble with their parents, has to end with those words where I turn to the kid and say, you did the wrong thing. That's why you were suspended for two days. You're coming back into the school now. Let's start fresh. I can't, I'm not going to constantly look at you in the hall and say, you're that kid that did that thing, right? Um, with my own children, how frequently with my own children do I have to help them reset themselves? Where I say, I get it. You slept late for the last month. I yelled at you. You ended up crying. You feel bad. I feel bad. Let's start fresh. Let's set an alarm. Let's start a new habit with each other. And how many times am I going to let my children start fresh? Honestly, between me and you, probably a, an infinite number of times. I don't know. I don't want God to test me on that. But oh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for a reset. For our friends and our families and our communities, we have to offer it to them. We have to give them that opportunity. This is not a Yom Kippur class or a Shana class, but it's something to think about. For ourselves, how many of us think about ourselves that we are trapped in a permanent system, internal system that we can't get out of? The Torah rejects that philosophy. All systems are available for a reset. When you reset, you open yourself up to a returning. That returning, that tushuva, is the same as Naomi's return to her homeland. Naomi, when she comes back, says, my name is Mara, right? Call me Mary, whatever she calls herself, right? She says, call me bitterness. And it will end with her resuming her name of pleasantness, of Naomi. So that's the thoughts I want us to take into the holiday of Shavuot. And yes, one thing that I'm afraid of with the current state of the world, my number one fear, no, my number two fear, my number one fear is that anybody that I love and anybody near me and anybody in the world actually should be sick and ill and suffering. That's my number one fear and I don't want it and, and I'm, I'm, I'm afraid all the time. My number two fear is that when we emerge from this, do we, do we just go back to our old habits? And how sad would that be? How tragic would that be? And so I'm thinking very deeply right now, I'll say as a principal of a school, of how to create permanent healthy change out of this tragedy, how to use it to create a real permanent healthy change. And I offer that up to all of you.